lighting, body, colors. My name is Lothar Eri, and I am honored to be chairing this first panel. It's a normal, regular panel of this fantastic conference. Um, and it's entitled Saving International Trade Agreements Potential of Package Treaty. And if you think that the term package uh, uh, treaty has anything to do with the uh, package deal approach of uh, the Uruguay round, single undertaking, then uh, you should, in the course of this session, learn how you are wrong and not entirely either. And we will have uh, on, on this panel uh, four eminent trade law scholars uh, who will shed light on different aspects um, of this uh, program. I will quickly uh, introduce an idea. I will quickly introduce them to my to my left is Charlotte Divagata, who is Senior researcher at the Graduate Institute in Geneva yeah. and trade law lecturer in Zurich and Lucerne. Then to the very right is Gregory Schaffer from the University of California, Irvine Law School. So far, but from September onwards. And I think until I heard that. Oh, okay. Oh, I heard that. <laughs> actually already then. Um, no longer there, but at Georgetown University in law school. Um, to my right is Timothy Meyer, um, professor at Duke University uh, Law School, also teaching international law, international trade law, including environment. And to the very left is Rohan, who is a PhD candidate at the Geneva Graduate Institute. Where I'm also a career civil servant from India. Uh, just wanted to mention this to highlight that the views expressed are personal, not the opinion of the government. Very good. And now first uh, the floor uh, to Charlotte Zivagasa to introduce to us generally uh, idea and project and uh, framework. Thank you so much. It's a true pleasure to be here and to see how this new format of the panel will work for everyone. Um, now, uh, very quickly, this is part of a larger multi-year research project called Making Trade Agreements Work in Service of Society that is based in Geneva at the Graduate Institute. And it's an interdisciplinary project, so we represent here the legal part of the team, but there are also international relations involved and economies. And what we basically attempt to do is to figure out ways how you can design trade policy in a way to mitigate and minimize negative imp imp impacts of trade in relation for labor and for the environment and for the climate. So we are focusing on what is actually a negative impact of trade liberalization. We differentiate between impacts that are perceived negative, but might be necessary for the benefits of trade to actually materialize. So restructuring of the yeah. et cetera, and impacts that are actually not necessary and that could be mitigated or entirely prevented if we took the necessary measures to do so. Um, also, we, we look at what is actually, what kind of policies to work or how can we organize these policies, and we will hear a lot about that. We call this flanking policies. These are measures that are directly linked with specific trade liberalization. So at the same time, combining commitments in trade liberalization with commitments on mitigation of potential negative impacts of that Liberalization. These are flanking measures. And then, of course, we also look at the general regulatory framework like unemployment policies in the domestic market of countries involved, that then would be the mitigate policy also linked to our trade liberalization. Um, the title of our, our um, panel, Package Treaties, that would then be the ultimate goal to essentially present uh, a toolbox for policymakers 
how to create package treaties, meaning treaties that package together commitments to trade liberalization with meanings, flexing, mitigating, flanking policies of trade liberalization. That's then called a package treaty. I leave it at that. Thank you very much, Charlotte. So now that you understand what the itself the underlying title of this panel really uh, is about, we'll hear from the great Schaffer. We will start with an overview of reconceptualizing trade agreements, social inclusion, sustainability. Was it at eight minutes? Okay, good. I'm going to stand up because I just can't see people in the back row. You can't see us. And so, so this is about um, you know, the issues of favor, environment, and so forth, and whether or not to deal with them inside the treaty themselves. And I just thought I'd start off with something. I just happened to come across reading, and this is from 1861. This is addressed to the American Anti-Slavery Society. It was about trade, but of course about inter in internal American trade. The South says that slavery is nothing to us at the North, but through our trade, we are brought into constant contact we grow familiar with it. Still more, we thrive by it. And the next step is easy, to consent to the sacrifice of human beings by whom we prosper. It's not as nice to put that in historic context of what lies behind this project. If you think about, I wanted this to start off, but what do we mean by externalities, by neg in negative externalities in particular? I mean, economists speak about externalities in terms of the effects of an activity that are not incorporated in price. But I'm going to break down externalities into at least three types. One are material externalities. You can think of clearly in the environment, the environmental damage that's not incorporated into the price of the product. Um, potentially with respect to jobs, with respect to human beings, externalities. Second, I want to talk about moral externalities. And that is, this is, ties into Tim's work. And when we consume, when the North consumes products from slave labor, it is complicit in that, in, in, in that abuse of human beings. And the third is political. And that is just to think about the backlash that clearly is driving this project and this whole sort of push to how do we reconceptualize what trade agreements are about, because you see the political backlash, not just in the United States, but other countries around the world. And these externalities, of course, overlap. You can have one single measure involving all of those types of externalities, but I still think they differ. So I'm just going to put forth a hypothesis that at least with respect to climate change, it's basically a material externality. It's really not a political externality. There's no political pressure in the US government that if we don't do something about climate change, we're gonna like have this populist, you know, authoritarian leader. No, that, that it's really what drives labor is different, at least in the US context. You really have a sense of growing inequality and somehow the haves come out ahead. And this sort of, you could think about this in, Part then is a moral externality that we are consuming products from other uh, involving abuses that we should be able to do something about. Okay, so if you think about this, the typical, the, the standard, the way we we learn trade law in um, well, <laughs> um, it was that it was a two-step model, right? That basically at the domestic level, you would deal with environmental law, you would deal with labor law and so forth. You would redistribute to those who were left behind. But at the um, international level, the in terms of trade agreements, there was no reason to put these into, into the agreement itself. And this is under pressure now, and we see this in terms of the trade agreements that the United States and Europe are signing. They basically are packaged treaties. So we're seeing this development in you know, different examples. So the, obviously, when we think about managing negative externalities, there are different institutional choices. You can do this domestically, as I just said, the traditional model. You can do it unilaterally. Uh, you can see CBAM as a unilateral measure. You can see U.S. with you know provisions on forced labor as mm -hmm. unilateral measures. Right? You can see this as flanking policies, uh, but they are unilaterals. Um, you can see hard law, soft law, and you can see parallel treaties. So if you think about the BEPS uh, sort of tax treaties going through the OECD, they're clearly about redistribution, about having 
money for the state to be able to redistribute, but it's a parallel agreement, even though taxes link clearly with respect to trade and investment and so forth. So I'm just going to say, with respect to climate change, I mean, this was raised this morning, I, my own view is that unilateral measures are going to be essential to address this. The ideally unilateral measures such as CBAM then are going to create pressure to incorporate them in some sort of uh, by, uh, you know, plurilateral or potentially multilateral agreement. Uh, but just as, and I, and I, in a paper I'll write up, if you take a look at how the Montreal Protocol dealt with ozone layer, and it not only involved technology transfers, um, and, but it involved trade measures. Trade measures were critical to make that work. So that, in fact, it was a trade ban. It was the, the, the most restrictive of all trade measures. That was incorporated in the treaty outside of the trade system, but it was a, a, uh, a trade measure. We, you're not going to be able to address challenges of climate change unless you create incentives. And the way to create incentives is to have some form of trade measure. And they're going to be unilateral at first, but ultimately they could be put into package duties. Labor is very different, right? In the sense that I don't think that it's, it will, it's, I think there is a rationale, I've written this before, for countries not to be complicit in terms of their own consumption with respect to the impact of other labor on, on workers abroad. But clearly, this can be abused, right? So my own proposal is, is for some social dumping measures to be accepted, uh, as that you could raise tariffs based on uh, countries' uh, failure to meet core labor public uh, protections. Um, but somehow this would be disciplined. And but both of these would have to be disciplined, right? Both with respect to environmental measures, unilateral ones, and with respect to labor ones. And I see that discipline then as a way to think about what the WTO already does and the reason why you would need a functioning dispute settlement system within the WTO. Because otherwise, we know sort of the, the, the unilateral sort of protectionist. Uh, incentives to use environment, labor, and so forth to basically inflict costs, and which in turn are externalities on this particular force in the most vulnerable system. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, also, for yielding some, some of your time, you can see where my minute under the also. Um, so you, and you will you will be given that time for in the, in the next round. And we can then uh, move on seamlessly with uh, Tim Meyer, who will tell us about second generation flanking policies to address extraterritorial and non economic spillovers from trade liberalisation. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks all of you for uh, for, for coming. Um, so, uh, Charlotte introduced a little bit the idea of a flanking policy. Um, so, the, the idea that you have a uh, policy that is designed to support trade liberalization by ameliorating uh, risk that trade liberalization creates. Um, and so, uh, the idea that I'm working with is that we basically have seen a shift um, in the uh, kinds of risks that um, the flanking policies are designed to address. So I'm going to briefly describe, um, in the interest of time, just very briefly, first and second generation uh, flanking policies, as I conceive of those things. And then I'm going to talk about um, some of the challenges that the, this shift to second generation flanking policies poses for international law and international, uh, international trade law. So um, first generation flanking policies, as, as I use that term, uh, are basically policies that are designed to address economic harms from trade liberalization that are suffered within the enacting country. So uh, the classic example of this would be uh, trade adjustment assistance in the United States. Um, trade adjustment assistance is a program that provides uh, what are essentially subsidies um, to workers, uh, primarily workers, although also uh, to, to firms and farmers who have lost uh, their uh, jobs as a result of trade liberalization. So tra uh, trade adjustment assistance, GAA, um, came uh, around in the United States in 1962. There have been a number of countries that have replicated um, this program. The EU has a, has a program that is sort of similar um, in, in various ways. There's a lot that we could say about TAA. I'm not going to say much more about it. Um, but it's really the paradigmatic example of a first-generation flanking policy. Um, it is uh, designed to fix 
a specific economic harm, the loss of jobs that is suffered within the country that is adopting the policy in question. The United States is, a, is offering subsidies to its own workers who've lost their jobs as a result of uh, a trade agreement. Second generation flanking policies are uh, neither of those things. That is, they are primarily aimed at non-economic uh, harms from trade liberalization, and they are uh, primarily extraterritorial in their reach. Okay, so the examples here would be the EU's CBAM, um, the Carbon Border Adjustment Measure, the EU's deforestation uh, regulation, uh, US uh, and, and uh, any ban essentially on imports of products made with forced labor. Um, these kinds of um, policies are clearly designed to address risks that, as Greg already alluded to, um, arise when you start to trade goods that are produced in a way that um, your uh, government or your, um, your public finds objectionable. And so you don't want to be uh, complicit in uh, facilitating or funding uh, an activity that uh, you find uh, harmful. Um, the risk of those activities is increased uh, quite significantly by um, the fact that there are low trade barriers. So trade liberalization is what facilitates that risk. And so you need some sort of trade policy that is uh, designed to uh, address um, the risk. So this is why I can see that these are second generation flanking policies. They are designed to support um, the overall liberalization of trade by uh, eliminating trade in um, products that are or conceivably services that are um, produced in a way that uh, governments find uh, objectionable. So uh, in the last uh, four minutes or so, uh, I just want to talk about some of the problems that this shift uh, creates. Um, and there are, uh, I think, at least uh, two problems. One is a specific problem and another is a general problem. The specific problem is that the tools that second generation planning policies use are much more difficult to um, conceive of as compatible with trade law. They tend to be uh, straight out uh, import bans uh, in the case of, for instance, forced labor measures. Um, they tend to be duties that are assessed at the border uh, in the case of uh, the EU CBAM um, and uh, you know, the, the sort of uh, uh, global arrangement on, on sustainable steel and aluminum that the US has proposed would essentially externalize a, a, a sort of carbon tariff model and a carbon club. These kinds of uh, systems are just much more problematic from a trade law point of view than the uh, primarily subsidy-based system that attended first generation flanking policies. And so this has created a need to rethink um, how we uh, are going to uh, proceed to justify um, the use of these policies within the multilateral trading framework. Um, or are you going to adopt an approach closer to what the U.S. has done, where um, you are willing to essentially partially suspend um, uh, portions of the multilateral framework uh, in order to pursue these, um, these kinds of objectives? And to some extent, I think you can see the conflict, um, particularly between the U.S. and the EU, over the approach to the WTO as symptomatic of, of, of how do you answer that question? Right? How do you implement these second-generation flanking policies that both the U.S. and the EU are interested in? Um, and how do they work in relation to the multilateral system? Um, the final point I want to make is just that uh, I think that um, what we're seeing in the trade law system is part of a larger shift in the kind of jurisdictional claims that uh, states are making about uh, their ability to regulate. And so the basic claim here, and I have a longer paper about this uh, as well, the basic claim is that um, states used to claim jurisdiction to regulate production-based activities on a purely territorial basis. Um, but increasingly, they uh, claim the authority to regulate uh, production-based activities if they consume the goods or services that, um, uh, that are in question. Um, and that's a radical reorientation of the jurisdictional principles, and it's not limited to trade law. So I think um, it, it definitely the deforestation regulation, the EU CBAM, forced labor regulations, they all have this at their, uh, at their core. Um, the EU has, I think, uh, articulated this uh, most clearly in the context of deforestation regulation, just the idea that um, the fact that the EU consumes goods gives it an interest in um, the productive um, uh, the way in which those goods are produced. Um, within trade law, we can have a longer conversation about what this means for the product versus um, production distinction. I'm going to gloss over that at the moment. And I just want to acknowledge that, uh, or I want to say that, that this is a trend that um, I think we see in other areas of economic law as well. 
Um, and so Greg has already alluded to the BEPS initiative. BEPS is squarely within this uh, space. The, the redistribution of authority to tax that's going on under the um, BEPS initiative is basically a redistribution from countries that we might within tax law describe as producing countries to countries that are consuming the digital, actively in the digital services space, the digital services that that uh, that are going to that are going to be taxed. Um, you have a similar thing going on in, in competition law, although competition law doesn't occupy nearly, uh, I think, the space that um, trade and and tax do. Um, but I think that uh, as we start to re, if we think of this as sort of a um, a reorientation of our jurisdictional principles in international economic law. It starts to uh, make uh, it starts to help answer that first question about how we justify the use of these um, policies within international economic law in a way that is more sensible than trying to answer some of the questions we were grappling with this morning about exceptions and their relation to primary rules. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, and now we can uh, move to Talonda, who will to us about how to address collective action problems, and notably with regards to common concerns to humanity, now with a, an example that relates to uh, Indonesia, uh, but that will only play a certain role in her presentation, which otherwise will still be um, general, uh, but already a first step of moving into a country uh, perspective. And of course, after we heard in a certain way being presented the perspective of the United States, EU, those were the main ones you mentioned, uh, to also um, look at this from the perspective of other countries and notably developing countries. Shalom. Thank you very much. So what I think we haven't really addressed in quite some detail here is that it's kind of the reason why we identified the need to have a better and more closer look at this kind of policy. And that is linked with the regulatory silos that have just, they have traditionally been in place um, since we actually established the GATT. So that we have at the international level binding commitments that are um, here to stay that do not need to be you know, renegotiated, they do not need to, to be reassessed, um, that bind obligations in trade liberalization. And then typically at the domestic level, through domestic um, laws, we would address potential spillovers, negative effects of these international uh, permanent obligations in trade liberalization. Now, typically what we have witnessed over the years is that this kind of separation or division of, um, of tasks has not actually resulted in what is required to really protect the environment and protect uh, labor from long-term unemployment. Because at the, the these uh, domestic laws are not permanent, they need to be rene renegotiated. They're mostly part of um, state budget, so they there also might be constraints that actually there are not the you don't do not have the funds to increase um, social security programs, etc., that might be necessary due to the permanent um, obligations at the international level. But then we also have a second kind of regulatory silo that was kind of part of the discussions this morning as well at the international level, that we do have the separation of, um, that, that we limit the obligations of the WTO explicitly only on trade and leave the other aspects, trade-related aspects as labor standards or environmental protection or climate change mitigation to other international fora. So as you all know, over time, this has create, created a policy incentive to actually always favor international economic law obligations over other obligations to, to the very effective dispute settlement proceedings at the WTO. So, these initiatives that we have heard of, um, second generation of flanking, they're all trying to address these regulatory silos that have, have, have led to these um, 
uh, consequence is that uh, a lot of people are no longer supported supporting trade liberalization. And I wanted to look at, have a closer look and better understand how we could use these new tools, these new initiatives in a way to overcome the collective action problem in which international economic law plays a very critical role. And that's linked to what Tim didn't really discuss in quite some detail. It's linked to the non-product related processing and production standards, which cannot be the basis for differential treatment under international economic law. So if one country decides to increase standards in environmental protection or labor protection, that creates a economic disadvantage for its own industry that the country typically cannot come to balance through tariff incomes. So this collective action problem seems to be at the heart of many of these initiatives. Um, and it could actually, if we would find a way to resolve these collective action problems, we could also um, better address uh, common concerns of both uh, humankind. No, I have no clue how much time I have left. How much time do I have? You have three, three, four minutes. Four minutes. Only halfway. Okay, very good. So, common concern of humankind. Um, let me, that's a, a little excurs here. Um, is basically in literature, we do not have a general definition of what constitutes common concern of humankind, but there seems to be an agreement an emerging consensus that it's about uh, problems or concerns of global significance, so they are um, transboundary, not limited to one country itself, that it's concerns of uh, uh, great gravity and um, potential irreversibility, and it's about uh, concerns that require collective action and also are linked with collective responsibility. So typically that would be global warming. It would also be uh, loss in biodiversity and loss in cultural diversity. I would add that perhaps also extreme poverty should be on that list. And um, actually groundwater pollution, something that for some reason has not yet really reached um, uh, the, the kind of urgency at the international level that I think it would deserve. I would like to make an additional argument that also maintaining a practice um, could constitute a common concern of humankind if failing to do so actually creates um, major problems at the international level that uh, are potentially irreversible. So maintaining trade relations, trading essential goods could actually also qualify as a common concern of humankind. Because as we have seen during, during the pandemic and also now more recently, unfortunately, in due to the to yeah. Russia's war in, in Ukraine, is that trading essential goods actually is um, necessary to protect livelihoods and lives around the world. So by taking this into consideration, um, trade liberalization packages, so the combination between um, actual obligations in trade liberalization, which protect the basic regulatory framework that the rules-based global market um, is built on, and therewith also protect trade in essential goods as part of a common concern in kind, while at the same time addressing those other aspects like climate, change, mitigation, the protection of biodiversity, etc., would be theoretically the ideal instrument to do so and overcome these very urgent collective action problems that we have been dealing with for, for a while. So I looked through the collection of different trade liberalization packages that we have already collected in Geneva. And, um, it might not surprise you, but it surprised me that basically of all these different initiatives that we are seeing today, only very few are designed in a way that they could indeed create this, um, this kind of trigger to overcome collective action problems, which could also like the Montreal Protocol that we have already heard, heard about, or perhaps the OECD corporate minimum tax that um, clearly 
was designed in a way to overcome collective action problems. And what we tried to do, what we tried to do is actually to find ways, best practices, how these type of um, new flanking measures, type of new initiatives could indeed be used in a way to overcome the collective action problems linked with international economic law and concerning human rights. Thank you, thank you very much. This is the this is the most disciplined uh, panel uh, that has ever existed uh, at uh, any academic conference, and not only uh, in in trade laws. Now it's a great achievement of yours. Uh, well, me to make make a little joke. What what happens normally um, sometimes also gives rise to witty remarks. For example, at the last CL conference, there was. The final round table, which was entitled the rule of law, something else. Um, and all the speakers went over there a lot of time. And the uh, fourth, um, last or last but one uh, speaker, Joseph Weiler, uh, started to speak by saying, Well, it's funny to have a panel on the rule of law, and then nobody on the panel respecting the rules um, of, of the panel. So uh, we have a different subject, and maybe that's why. Uh, this panel is doing so much better. Um, thank you very much for uh, for this, Charlotte. And now, Rohan, you have the floor to talk to us about the potential of trade liberalization packages in addressing negative spillovers on labor in India. To conclude our first round. Thank you, Lothar. Uh Let me play a spoil sport here. And let me ground the discussion in the harsh realities on the ground. So I mean, I would steer the direction of this discussion towards developing economies. So we must understand that the regulatory environment, the landscape in developing economies is different from those in advanced economies. So their policy response to negative effects of trade liberalization also varies and is influenced, constrained by the regulatory challenges in their respective jurisdictions. So for instance, to illustrate my point, I take the example of labor market in developing economies, which is characterized by large informality. Now, the degree may vary in, from one country to other, but that is a reality. So the policy response in terms of labor adjustment policies that each country devises to address uh, job losses arising out of trade liberalization also is challenged, shaped, and constrained by the prevailing informality and the related labor market characteristics. To dig deeper, I examine India in detail and look at how India has responded to trade-related job displacements in the past and is constrained by its own labor market characteristics. So India has a dual labor market, a large informal sector. Almost 90% of the workforce is engaged in the informal sector. The remaining 10%, of course, in the formal sector, but most of the laws are focused on the formal sector with the result that the social safety and security net only applies to workers employed in the formal sector, leaving out those in the informal one. Now, there is a problem of data. There's insufficient data when you're targeting devising programs to address their problems. At the same time, the laws that are applicable in formal sector are very rigid. So they also add barriers to mobility of workers. So there are rigid hire and fire rules, there are rigid compensation rules, which do not apply to informal sector. So that exacerbates, in a way, the informality. So with this background, if we talk about how India has designed its flanking measures to address trade-related job displacements, there is a two-dimensional approach, one within the trade agreement in the form of staging of tariffs. So although it's gradual, it has become very gradual, actually. So there are long tariff schedules, long phasing periods, there are a number of exclusions of sensitive items which are of concern to the trading partner with the result that the trade agreements end up becoming shallow. Safeguard arrangements, of course, are another instrument, but uh, they have hardly been used, so they are not much concern. When we talk about the domestic policy space, we have domestic labor adjustment policies, unlike what we have a targeted program in the US. We do not have a TA-like program. It's more or less designed on the lines of EU with a lot of challenges. As I have discussed before, it has a compensation aspect and an adjustment aspect, but the problem lies therein. How do you compensate? You have resource constraints. 
then you do not have data to cover workers in the informal sector. So how do you devise a compensation program that, that is exclusionary in nature? Now, when you talk about laws that are rigid and apply only to the formal sector, so again, the social safety programs that are linked to these laws do not apply to the informal sector. Now you have skill development programs. How do you reach out to the intended beneficiaries when they do not know actually how many are there? So these are some of the challenges which actually reduce the effectiveness of domestic policies, which eventually translates into lack of policy space while dealing with the problem of job losses. So in the end, they try to, the policymakers grapple with the challenge of whether to focus more on the protectionist instruments within the trade agreements while negotiating, or should they strengthen the domestic policies, which of course is not possible in the short run, with the result that India ends up relying too much on the protectionist instruments. As a result, you've seen in RCEP, India withdrew because it could not pacify domestic opposition from various interest groups such as textile, uh, dairy cheese industry, fearing imposed from China. That was purely because India did not have policy space within the domestic policies to support their protection instruments within the trade agreements. So to sum up, I raised few pertinent questions relating to developing economies as a whole, because what applies to India also applies to a lot of other countries, as to how do you design flanking policies? Do you leave it to the governments to design their own domestic policies? Or you want them to link to trade agreements in form of some commitments so that there is a, you know, a continuity in implementation and it's not purely left to the domestic governments, which they have failed so far. Do you also want to shift the focus from binding labor provisions, which haven't worked so far, and get into a TAA-like program being incorporated in trade agreement, as Tim has suggested in one of his earlier papers? Can we have a capacity adjustment, capacity building program built in within the trade agreement, not worded in a best endeavor language, but in a more binding commitment form? So these are some of the questions that I leave you with, and maybe we can discuss more on the solutions in the later part. Thank you. You, you have uh, time left if you want to tell us uh, more about the solutions, because uh, so far I heard I, uh, about big challenges. Yes. Uh, but I would, maybe you can already now give us at least some or partial responses, notably this, to this question of uh, informal uh, sector. And yeah. I did not know these numbers. They are very striking. Uh, can you just clarify, is this 90, uh, 10, is this a all or nothing uh, measurement, which would surprise me a bit, because I would have assumed that there are many people who have both, they have a formal job, maybe that is so, uh, not full time, and in addition. So, so basically this number captures the informal workers who are part of the informal or the unorganized sector, and also on contractual basis in the formal sector. So what happens is there are a lot of laws that uh, are linked to the number of employees who are engaged in a firm. So in order to reduce the cost of regulatory compliance, a lot of firms tend to reduce their number of employees to avoid this, and they outsource their work on contract to workers. So as a result, you will find a lot of contractual workers being engaged within the formal sector, which is also the case in China and other lot of developing countries. So this is a problem that pervades, this is a regulatory issue which needs to be addressed through labor reforms. So if I talk about the solutions, uh, there I have grouped the solutions in two parts. One is the regulatory issue relating to the design of the laws, the legal aspect, and the other is the implementation issue. The implementation issue becomes more important because there's no paucity of laws. You name the law, they have it. But the problem is how are they actually implemented on ground? So do they have the capacity to actually implement these laws on the ground? How do you augment the capacity? They do not have the capacity within to implement them. So maybe need, they need some kind of an assistance and that assistance could be provided through a trade agreement in the form of some kind of an ex ante commitment based on some impact analysis. And once these agreements are built in within a trade agreement, it would be a win-win solution for both the countries because what the trading partner is looking for is more open access to certain section of industries, which the uh, developing countries normally hesitate to open. When you provide them an incentive to open up their economies by providing them adjust, uh, adjust, uh, adjustment assistance, then there is an incentive for them to open those sectors. So in a kind, it works for both the parties. Besides, digitization is one of the most important steps 
in that case, I would say India has worked really well on the digitization front with the scale that they have to operate. So almost 30 to 40 crore workers in the informal sector have been registered on a portal and they are trying to link the bridge between formal and informal sector so that at least what we are trying to do is make sure we have the data to target the workers through designing various programs. So there are various programs, but we do not know how to target them. So digitization is one step which maybe other developing countries can learn from India. The most challenging part is labor reforms. So India consolidated almost 29 labor laws into four broad categories addressing most of these issues. But the problem is within the constitutional framework, it is the states or the federal level, sub-federal level, who have to implement them on ground. And because of political compulsions, they cannot. Now, how do you drive these reforms? Can these reforms be driven through trade agreements? Can they act as a push or maybe through a stick? So that is something which we need to maybe think about how these reforms can be pushed. There is a very interest, there's a very interesting development that has happened in India, which I term it as competitive federalism. So trade liberalization itself as, acts as a flanking measure to drive the internal reforms. So a lot of states who, in order to drive investment within, they are trying to compete with each other by relaxing their own labor laws. So till now, what we have observed is race to the top, but there's also a concern regarding the race to the bottom. But as long as they result in bringing out reforms on the ground, it is always welcome. So maybe these are some of the points that we can work on in greater detail and see how they can be linked with trade agreement within the framework of flanking provisions that we have talked about. That would be, I think, a great service. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so this was our, our first round. We have, as you have seen, received uh, additional members of the audience, which we must have successfully uh, lured away from competing uh, panels uh, at this time. And so far, we haven't lost anyone uh, from the audience. Uh, this can happen, but our aim is that this doesn't happen, uh, at least not in equivalent numbers, as, as another uh, good sign. Um, and I will now um, ask specific questions uh, of, for each of those, but each time, the subsequent speaker and you also, Greg, at the end, uh, should feel free as well to comment on anything uh, heard uh, so far. Um, so, Greg, um, I want to ask you about your idea, which you presented, was very understandable, of your natural measures as incentives to be uh, more open um, towards the idea of uh, multilateral uh, coordination. Um, what is your reply if um, notably developing countries or countries from the global south, whatever term you choose, uh, then say uh, to us this feels like a coercion um, and that's not, not allowed? And can you additionally also say something about um, the social dumping? Because I think you have not addressed it so far, but only uh, if you want. And uh, thirdly, a question to you is at the very beginning, you have uh, plausibly set out uh, in something which my knowledge so far has not been said and heard uh, very often uh, everywhere, uh, this idea that a importing country uh, consuming, uh, allowing imports uh, becomes complicit uh, in what is going on in the country of production, but of course only for that part of the production that is destined to the country of um, importation. And, and so there my question to you is, um, uh, is there a perhaps even under human rights obligations to uh, do something about it and not uh, nothing was done in old days, general option still today, the best preference. Maybe I'll start, uh, Alan, I, I do I have more than eight minutes, right? Like 20, 30 minutes, because <laughs> um, you have to take questions. But the, the last one I think is the easiest. And I think, yes, from, well, let me just start by saying one thing I didn't say about externalities, right? Which is the problem we're trying to address externalities, trade agreements, there are externalities everywhere. They're omnipresent, right? Um, not only that, all externalities, this goes back to COS, the problem of social costs, they're reciprocal, right? 
Uh, but you think about, I mean, his famous examples is, you know, do you have a preference for noise or quiet, right? So you have a factory, which makes a lot of noise, a doctor's office moves in the neighborhood, doctor complains that they're making a lot of noise, but it was the doctor who moved in, right? So how do you conceptualize the externality? Clearly there's an externality of making noise, but there's also the externality of having moved and asking someone to, to shut down their factory, right? And so you can see this in terms of basic north-south conflict, adopt a policy that's going to have repercussions on workers in the, the, in the global south. You adopt a, a trade measure to try to address climate change that's going to have repercussions in the global south. So that's just a starting point. I mean, it is, we can't get around that. It makes the, the, the complicit question a little bit more difficult because if you are leaving that for a while, Right, that there is like a answer, right? Then there's a well, no, the problem about externalities goes away, right? Because you just say, oh, no, it's like this is the truth, right? This is the only way to proceed. And so, of course, you're conflicted, right? If you don't apply a trade better and so forth. But I think, given the messy world that we live in, and given that you know people have very different experiences, priorities, and situations, I think that it, that it's the world of natural law or something in the past. But you see it's still so alive and well um, in terms of uh, the dates that we're having today. So that's a sort of big picture. The second question is in terms of coercion. I mean, of course, you have a trade measure that's, you know, that, that, that has an impact right on third party. Um, and that third party is going to feel that impact. That's just the nature of trade measures. But I think that's the world that we have to address. And I think that the problem is, and this is where I had issues with Vera Sorsenson this morning, is of course she's right, right? In terms of, you know, the, the problem with the, the power of the United States and Europe to set standards in the world on climate change and so forth. But at the same time, the planet is burning up, right? And if we just sit and say, uh, we need to discuss this endlessly, um, we've been doing this, we've had more, conferences on climate change over decades and temperatures continue to rise, the threats continue to increase, and those who are going to receive the brunt of the harm are those in developing countries, those who are big. Um, and so we need to do something, and the only way to do something is start thinking about incentives. Um, if we don't think about basic incentives, we're never going to solve this problem. And so there has to be some sort of space um for some sort of measures and they're gonna have to start you know laterally but it can't be we just don't have time and so that's really the reason why i'm a defender of europe's approach to see that it's a much better approach than the u.s approach to try to be bolder lateral of course part of that has to recognize that the differential treatment part of that has to incorporate technology transfers that occur during with respect to the ozone uh, negotiations part of that has to have different timelines and different treatment for for uh for countries and so forth so that has to be part of it but the idea that we're not going to have any trade measures or sort of links to global greenhouse emissions which i think is a is a, is a false starting point um, and so so that means though that the key role of a trade agreement is hopefully at some point this will can be incorporated to a package treaty but in the meantime there needs to be authority and a uh, a third uh, an independent third party to check abuse and that's the role of that's the traditional role of, of the WTO and and, and it, and we need to see it in that way. Um, because once you have a unilateral policy, of course, a unilateral measure, it's not the end of the day. It's not either or, right? It's an opening point for deliberations, discussions, and that sort of stuff. Uh, and so it's part of a, a broader transnational process, uh, which then hopefully we can see this moving, you know, being incorporated in, in uh, and broader agreements. That's, that's the way I see, that would be my response to the, I think it's too simplistic to say, of course, in any trade measure is, of course, has, of course, it is. Um, the, uh, the, the, the social dumb thing is, of course, is the most controversial, but I think, you know, if we're going to address the problem with respect to labor, uh, and the, in the, this, the, this shift, what globalization has done, it's, it's clearly 
from a Marxist materialist perspective, has empowered capital these people for capital is just in a much broader negotiating position when it can say, I'm going to move my plant to Mexico if you strike, or if you don't do a mid package deal, I'm going to move my, my plant to, to another country and so forth, especially with new capital flows, just change the bargaining leverage. And so in order to, uh, to be able to re-equilibrate this, I think you need to have some form of social dumping measures uh, where you have to be a Start off where we already have this a trade agreement. This most trade agreements and agreement. I, I I prefer the European approach in terms of core labor rights that are internationally defined through the international labor. We need to start with those if you're substituting Procedurally, the way I see this is that we already have anti-dumping laws with very complex procedures, right? We already have safeguards law with complex procedures. They actually haven't blown up the system, right? If you look at the percentage of trade that's been affected by anti-dumping, you know, if you really can see this as an attempt on politically safety valve. I mean, there's no, I, my own view, and I think most economists agree, there's no real explanation for anti-dumping law well, other than to create a political safety valve, right? And it, it, it means that we can continue to get along, we can continue to trade, um, but, when there are these, we have a, a process which permits a, an investigation where, which can lead to an increase in tariffs. But it's also subject, it has been subject, right, to discipline, right, to multilateral disciplines in terms of what you can do, what you can't do, what you need to show, what sort of reasons you need to give. It's, it's subject to a third party check. When you think about just transporting those procedures, which have been used to basically assess accounting mechanisms, right? They have you account for costs and so forth. That's what anti-dumping is all about. It's basically, you know, my account versus your account and try to expand the dumping margin. Now, instead of having a discussion and deliberation about the accounting, we can talk about how do we settle this issue in terms of addressing labor rights. That seems to me a much more positive a view of how to think about um, addressing the challenges of dumping than our current system. Um, you can think of constructive remedies. We have constructive remedies in terms of dumping law, but that basically just involves creating a cartel, reducing uh, reducing quantity or increasing prices and coming to that sort of agreement. Here, the agreement in theory should be something to address labor uh, rights. Um, and so to me, that would be a, an advantage of our current system. Obviously, it's going to, it's, it, it's not going to be seamless. It's going to face challenges and so forth. But I don't think it'd be the end of the system. I think it actually would protect the system that we have today if we're able to incorporate this. And my final point, and then I'll, I'll reply, is that in my view, a country can already do this under Article 28 Act. The challenge is, of course, there's no procedural disciplines whatsoever. Right? So it's so easy to subject it to abuse. And so it's much better to try to actually formalize it in terms of procedures, justifications, review, and so forth, and the current system. Excellent. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, I'm, I'm sure everybody or almost everybody in the audience has realized the gigantic explosiveness uh, uh, or innovative nature of uh, things you said notably uh, now uh, at the end to um, create a new uh, area in concept um, of uh, continuing trade protection, trade remedies, or trade defense, as they are called around the world. Uh, plus, uh, just to recall that anti-dumping uh, was so far a uh, Canadian uh, invention from more than 100 years ago. So uh, at last, uh, so, so something new after many years, plus your idea uh, that Article 28 uh, can already be used uh, for that. Uh, what you said on coercion, let me just uh, highlight that you use the term coercion in a very broad sense whenever uh, there is some um, mm -hmm. implementation, enforcement power uh, behind something. Um, and so you didn't necessarily mean it in the technical sense of a breach of international law in the form of interference in the sovereign affairs of another state. Uh, so if you're interested in that distinction, I recommend to you panel 21, uh, chaired on Friday by Thomas Cotier, 
who is uh, with us. But now we'll uh, move on to uh, Tim. And uh, Tim, from you, I'd like to hear some um, thoughts um, because um, I, I'm looking at um, uh, Federico or, or, or Pinar. I, I say to myself, um, we, although this is not the focus of this uh, session of what um, uh, the gut rules allow in terms of unilateral uh, measures, but you said cer certain things uh, which are not uh, everybody's view, and I would say not even mainstream anymore uh, today, although they uh, were much more so 20 years ago. Um, and that is the way where you said that um, unilateral measures are less difficult to justify. Um, in, on the WTO, uh, Charlotte, you also said that uh, uh, process and uh, production method based distinctions um, are not uh, possible. So that's uh, an existing, still existing view, notably in the South. Um, but I, I don't think this still qualifies as uh, mainstream. And the question to both of you, in fact, is. Um, isn't that relevant? Because if that is the starting point, which Greg even recommends, uh, then those things have to be legal. They can't be uh, illegal because otherwise, you you said it, uh, we move into the zone of what you called the US approach of suspending the WTO um, order. And that would, wouldn't that make uh, uh, all your whole plea uh, much more problematic? And less legitimate. Sure. So um, let me let me I think make two comments about that about that uh, point. Um, so uh, it, it seems to me that the United States and the European Union um, have they have a difference on um, policy with respect to how to address a variety of different um, types of, of externalities related to trade liberalization. But I think they have a bigger difference on how they want to reconcile those differences with multilateral uh, trading systems. And that bigger difference is that the European Union wants to um, basically, what I would describe, and I think you more or less said this, is see the rules or the interpretation of the rules evolve uh, in a way that is um, uh, results in European policies being consistent with WTO rules. Um, and the U.S. view, for reasons that extend well beyond the scope of this panel, which, which will be clear to most people here, I think, um, the U.S. view is that the uh, that's not a great way uh, for the institutional apparatus associated with the WTO to proceed. Um, that we actually don't want um, dispute uh, you know adjudicators to have this great interpretive uh, interpretive authority. And so you end up, I think, with um, uh, the U.S. and the EU. In my view, actually, not as far apart on policy as they are on this um, question of how uh, the trading system uh, understood to be more than just the WTO, but the, the sort of system itself, um, how it should evolve. Um, and uh, so I, I think this gets a little bit to your question so far as, um, you know, the as you say, you know, 20 years ago, I think the, the product versus process distinction would have had a much broader consensus, perhaps, um, as being a somewhat clear-ish line. Um, and and it, it, perhaps that consensus has sprayed today, but I don't think it's gone away. Um, I think it is still, uh, first of all, to the extent that we are uh, going to use cases to decide future cases, past cases to decide future cases, it's still with us. Um, and as, as your question itself acknowledged, right, it, it, it is not something that is, um, uh, you know, has, has left the world entirely. It is rather something that um, the, uh, I think in particular, the European Union has, has tried to sort of formulate a way in, in, in how it is uh, conceptualized some of its um, programs, um, particularly perhaps CBAM, um, station regulation and how it's going to go about defending those kinds of things. So my own view of the rules is consistent with yours, which is that I think that the, uh, I take it to be your view, I assume is your view, which is that um, these things should, should be consistent, should be deemed consistent with um, WTO rules. Um, having said that, and this is the second part of my answer, I also think the entire concept of border adjustability is so opaque as to be next to useless. Um, it is designed to prevent people from understanding what you are talking about. 
Um, and it is much easier. And so I, I have a longer paper that tried to track this across different areas of, of the economic law. It is much easier, I think, to think about uh, border adjustability as a sort of specific attempt to sort of describe uh, what is basically a concept of jurisdiction, right? Because if something is border adjustable, right, then as long as you're non-discriminatory, you're going to be okay. If it's not basically under trade rules, you've got a border measure and probably you're you're out of luck unless you can get by under one of the exceptions. So, um, you know, I think if you think of it that way, uh, it just becomes much easier to um, both make sense of what's actually happening in trade law, uh, as well as to justify some of these um, policies, right? It makes it easier to think about how we would understand trade rules um, to be operating. And so I, in this sense, again, I think I, I'm sympathetic with your sort of notion that this has evolved. And I think this is a cleaner way to describe it. And it also allows us to not be so siloed. It allows us to connect um, what's happening in trade law with what's happening in international tax, with what's, hap with what's happening in sort of general international uh, law with respect to jurisdiction, the expansion of effects jurisdiction, I think is to, you know, as a general principle of international law, I think is much more easily described as sort of a notion that if I'm consuming something, that is, that is the effect in most cases in my jurisdiction that provides the basis for, for instance, a competition regulation. Um, and so uh, I think we would do uh, all future trade lawyers, all of our future students, a great service if we could move away from thinking about product versus process, border adjustability, and just think about it, general international law um, uh, norms here uh, and what is actually happening. Um, and uh, hopefully I think that solves some of what I think is a really sort of a false disagreement between the US and the EU on, uh, on this particular, it, it's, it's not a policy disagreement, it's a disagreement about how we talk about uh, what we are, um, what we are saying. Yeah, that's a question. You, no, you, you, you can't. Okay. Yes. So I kind of think it's like a little bit more what you mean by the problem of border adjustment. But I just think about basic non-discrimination rules. You know, if I have, if I apply a regulation to my product, I can apply that to your product as well, right? Sure. Even though, and if I have an internal tax on my product, I can have it applied to the border, you know, to your mm -hmm. product as well. And so for climate, you know, if I have a climate Tax, right? I apply it at my, you know, to my companies inside my border. And when your product comes in, is, do you call that border adjustment or do you call that something else when you then try to calculate what you apply to that incoming product? So, you know, in other words, you do you call that as a do you call that a border tax adjustment or do you call it something else in terms of what? So, I would prefer not to call it a border adjustment at all. I would prefer to think of it as an exercise of. Assumption jurisdiction and the question would just be is it non discriminatory? Is it non discriminatory? Okay. Which is ultimately a very important question, anyhow, right? So, whether for border of general measure uh, or um, necessity to just about. I've seen your, your question, you will be the first to be uh, given uh, the floor, but I want to first uh, press uh, ahead and finish our second round, uh, after which we will uh, open uh, this up. So uh, you, you, Tim, you made me smile when you said that PPM looks like it was built to be difficult to understand. I'm not a PPM uh, specialist myself. Uh, these are colleagues of mine who, who do this almost uh, full time. But my impression is that it is so complicated so as to satisfy the requirements uh, which you may have to prove that you have been even handled and taken into account and everything that needs to be taken into account, but I will not uh, comment further given my lack of expertise. Um, instead, uh, stress uh, the very important and relevant saying thing you have said at the end, and which uh, also meets a great favor by me, namely the relevance of general rules of international law, and notably the delimitations of permitted um, exercise of uh, sovereignty. Um, uh, on which US and you have not seen eye to eye uh, over the last uh, years, but um, I would just comment on this and, and uh, maybe later we can uh, return to that. Uh, but my comment to this is that um, there is a view which I thought so far thought 
uh, is the mainstream and, and you are challenging that or disproving that. Uh, maybe you are right. And maybe um, many, including myself, have been wrong to think that this uh, effects doctrine and so on is not even relevant for what we and you are discussing because those things are the exercise of sovereignty on the home territory because it's the customs, customs authorities, which stand one meter behind the state border. And that's the only place where not only they act and enforce, but it's also the only place where requirements, obligations actually exist, which is uh, you have to pay 20% on the value of this, or you are not allowed to import this here or sell it uh, here. Um, whereas the uh, effects doctrine uh, is a possible and arguable and I think uh, majority view a basis for doing more than that. Um, and, and then you are on thinner eyes, uh, but you also have a basis uh, when you say, I am actually prohibiting what is happening there abroad, which often is misunderstood. The unilateral measures actually do, but they don't. They, they don't prohibit uh, forced labor to uh, take place elsewhere in the world. They just prohibit the sale of the products made like this here on the home um, uh, territory. But yes. be this as it may, uh, it is good because it's instructive that you uh, bring into the debate this um, effects doctrine because indeed uh, those effects uh, exist. And this is, you have um, described it as uh, modern, but at least in certain areas, this is uh, 100 years old, like many things in international law, uh, and notably criminal law. You know, crimes committed abroad against uh, citizens or interests of the uh, state exercise of jurisdiction, uh, as well as in competition law. Um, but Charlotte, can you please uh, briefly comment on um, what you said uh, regarding uh, the requirements imposed, uh, if it is unilateral measures, and if, whether you see any space or even necessity there um, if this suboptimal avenue was chosen, be it as a first step, uh, to um, apply what is known as um, the idea principle of common but differentiated um, responsibilities. And Greg also said certain things about that, that you have to have an exception. Is it actually uh, portable under uh, existing network, probably uh, 20, uh, or is it even required? Uh, you know that this uh, CPTR. Uh, approach is famous in the environment field, including the allergies. But if you want, what kind of? If you prefer not to enter into that, um, then do you want to comment on so, that? So the question is when, for instance, C bands should include some differential and. Frequency. For example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yes, that's something that we have uh, basically. LDCs. Yeah. Or or countries that haven't emitted uh, so much in the past. Is that relevant? It's not irrelevant. It's the, the Montreal Protocol provided for that, right? So there, we have a precedent. Yeah. But yeah, but that's a different treaty with its regime and uh, obligations. And my question is whether that has a place um, in the WTO. In the WTO. Well, I would, uh, <laughs> I, I've never asked that question, but what we have actually looked at or uh, discussed in Geneva within the project is actually that such unilateral measures like CBAN by the EU would require in order to create these incentives to overcome collective action problems and really uh, bring some movement into uh, the global policy would actually also require some kind of commitment to support countries that face difficulties economic uh, in their economic wise in meeting those new standards and so kind of kind of an obligation of industrialized countries that demand these kind of increases in, in standards that they provide technical support and uh, trade assistance they also um, we discussed um, yesterday evening that IP regulations could play a role in that to also provide um, 
uh, access to the necessary technology, etc. Whether or not, I mean, assuming that CBAM is in line with GATT um, Article 20, I, I'm sure that some form of differential treatment within the CBAM must also be in line with, with GATT 20, but maybe I'm not seeing that. Okay, well, no, no, this is a perfectly defendable position, but uh, many are defending. Uh, thank you, Ro Rohan. From, from you, I would like to hear, I know you've said it, but you're not speaking on behalf of the Indian government, but you have a much better idea than Ron and I, but also some others here in the room have about how uh, the Indian government or an Indian government or a government in other countries, you know, that, that are maybe different from India, but nevertheless, um, also developing countries, countries with um, challenges like these, and how they would uh, perceive, uh, like the idea of what I think Greg has uh, the beginning called the, this idea of, of stick and, and push. Um, you have yourself um, stressed more the uh, uh, capacity to implement, um, uh, to make uh, more effective at the domestic level to design laws and um, implement uh, them. Um, but what is your uh, prediction of uh, governmental reaction in international negotiations if this proposal? which um, you guys um, are ultimately aiming for, I believe that a package treaty is uh, put on, on the table. Yeah. So let me uh, try to frame it in a way. Uh, it's like prescribing a pill to cure, say, an outward manifestation of a disease, say fever, and not addressing the underlying problem. So I talk about labor provisions and trade agreements, have been more of a punitive measure casting obligations on third world countries, developing economies, and uh, not addressing the systemic issues. So they're bound to fail, uh, primarily because the regulatory landscape differs. So if you talk about a country like India, uh, interestingly, India hasn't had a labor provision single chapter in all its trade agreements so far. It has signed trade agreements with 12 countries. And now, more interestingly, it is negotiating trade agreements with countries like EU, US, Canada, who have a definite position on issues like labor environment. So that's where the challenge lies. So what we hear is negotiations getting stuck at these points. And then how do you make the trade agreement work? So if we follow the traditional template, where we are looking for similar binding provisions, dispute settlement, these are not going to work so far as I understand my own opinion. So this is not going to work. So you need something more than that. So the stick has been longer than the carrot. Maybe we need to have more incentives within the trade agreement, which could work for both the parties. And to that extent, I think flanking measures, both within the domestic policy space and the provisions within trade instruments need to support each other to make sure that these provisions work. For instance, in case of labor clause, you cannot expect India to comply with ILO provisions. India has all the laws in place, but what India, I think, fears is when it comes to implementation, things may be different on ground. So to ensure that things actually work on ground, there has to be an incentive, capacity building, for instance, adjustment assistance being built within the trade agreement you know, to kind, kind of provide an incentive and a negotiating position from where both the parties can move forward. It cannot be a red line here and then expecting India to take a step forward because that's their position historically and they know the situation on the ground. So that is where the problem lies. So it's about understanding the problems and then designing trade agreements to make them work. So we can have unilateral provisions, we can have second division flanking measures, but end of the day, they end up imposing one's own standards on different jurisdiction, which I think is something that we should keep it aside and move in a more uh, proactive approach, more constructive approach. Thank you very much.
And now let's open up and um, we'll collect a few. The very first question goes to very far back. And then Thomas. I think it's very sorry for being so much impatient, but it was really thought provoking to follow follow this discussion. But I want to go back to the very beginning conceptual and activity of the technology. And the plan is spread your taxonomy of developments material more and more. I have problems in equating those with negative. As you like to say, you get it to only those that are not respected. Excellent, so it's like the types that we think of it, but they are not negative. Excellent, there's no market say. Many of the side effects, negative side effects from labor, on, on, on social dimensions, they are they are not negative. Excellent, they are not market say. So, the, so we have to be contextually clear that um, what we pursue with efficacy is much broader than what, uh, what economists would address with negative. First point. Second point, um, um, Charlotte, to, your, to, to this package, if I understand it correctly, you want to package reciprocal elements, technically related to the with non reciprocal elements, social and labor. I wonder, talking about the, reg called the regulatory science, I wonder how you can exactly uh, make Oh, the reciprocal and not reciprocal elements into, into one treaty, how they should create a, 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 a treaty dynamic um, with giving and uh, with uh, bargaining and, and, and the reason. Third point, it goes to the, um, what, what Johan in tragedy said about India. I mean, at the end of the day, it's also about fiscal states. You have, have the country, the fiscal state, to do labor and social flanking measures. And I wonder if, if a much simpler way of packaging would be just to offer monetary compensation. That one party of the of the packaging treaty would offer monetary compensation to the other part and allow it us the fiscal space um, of that part. And last question is more institutional made. Uh, you want to already mention I don't know. I mean, how does all this go with the establishment structure that some international bodies are dealing with issues that we want to integrate? And the net context of this is maybe a very European perspective, European perspective, it's a competent. The European Union with the Commission that we would be competent European wide to, uh, to make the conception of trade with regulation, but not the social and labor with the member states and competent. So you would have a, a situation where uh, one part of the of the of the EU would not be able to actually implement what it was. Um, I think you will collect a, a third, um, but, on, but on competence, uh, you know, there's, there's a European Court of Justice uh, opinion. I think there's a Singapore or the Vietnam um, opinion that would shall not uh, you, you can do this. And maybe then uh, Federico or Federico and Pina. And then we will be in, depending on how complicated and complex the opinion is. Either take three or something I don't know. Um, the point of the government is not state, because it doesn't have any relevance. It's the first place. But this um, is really the really issue. Both said that, and in fact, it leads to also the question we posed to a lot of us in differentiated business. This is the real issue how we define and how we try to define non discrimination. This is the That's the real point. It's not about the dichotomy. I mean, we, 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 we lost that. The problem today is that the traditional economic dimension in the gap is the way it is. I think it's wrong. And, and that's where the, where the problems still lie. The PBMs almost automatically fail, or are highly likely to fail in the, the discrimination test. That's where the problem is. If you manage to change that interpretation and to solve the different problems, you have to treat different things the same. Now, how do you, why do they really go on? I, mean, I think we try, we have to start thinking differently. And I wonder whether, in terms of examples, whether the fact is. Now the investment is model could be a model, right? We put finance on a plate in order to ensure that the commitment are actually not meant to the ground. 
My question is let's go to something that has already been said. Is a trade agreement really the place uh, to, to have that discussion? I mean, I, you know, this, this attraction to trade agreements of sort of becoming, you know, the ultimate governance instrument. Uh, is, that, is that the best way to do it? I mean, I, I think it's a good way to do it, but are there other concerns you see? Sorry, I forgot that Thomas, you had been the second to raise your hand. So why don't you come now? Thank you very much. I just would like to ask the panel what what how did they see the potential of the enabling clause in uh, reconciling uh arms condition and the obligations under UNFCC and the Paris Accord on differential share responsibility? And the second question is about the uh, the labor. Market. I don't know whether you discussed that before I came in, but um, when we talk about package treaties, to what extent do we need to include today migration? Can we solve problems without migration, labor migration, of course, but maybe beyond that? And the idea comes to me because one, one response to the labor issues is being developed in migrations law by actually providing training, apprenticeship training. In return to trade concessions. And I wonder how you comment on this proposal that we see, uh, for example, countries investing, building institutions, apprenticeships, because in particular in India, the main challenge for this country will be in the future to compete on the world market to develop a labor force which is able to produce the quality which other countries are able to provide. And I think that would be a great investment uh, uh, where a lot of experience could be used. But is that something which goes beyond the kind of package you're envisaging and then goes back to whether the, the design is too large? Interesting. Unless there will be many questions are on exactly the subjects already covered. Uh, I, uh, no, no, I, uh, we will make sure. Uh, we can go there, but perhaps for everybody to be able to keep track, um, can we proceed that you, you choose whoever wants to, um, I mean, some questions were directly first from uh, you, there was also a question directly to you, but, but anyone should be free to briefly reply selected. There's a lot there. It's a very stimulating panel, so I hope we can have real conversation afterwards. Just on the externality, obviously there's a is it? It's it's also like all concepts. You know, they're not clean concepts; they're contested concepts. And there is an economic literature on moral externalities, on political externalities. You were referencing, you know, classical material externalities. Um, and then, of course, there's spillovers. And so, I think the package treaties project is involved both with classical external negative externalities, but also spillover, which is obviously a much broader term. Um, the uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, there's so much here. Um, I think the enabling clause is a great point, Thomas. I was also thinking, I mean, if you said you have multilateral environmental agreements, the question becomes, you know, where you've agreed to something in another treaty, you know, what's the interaction with that treaty with the interpretation of WTO rules? Because you've actually agreed, for example, to, you know, uh, differential treatment with respect to climate change responsibilities, the Kyoto Protocol or elsewhere. Um, I think that should be relevant. Your rules, migration ethics is clearly an issue before us. So I think any of these, you know, issues can be dealt, as I said before, unilaterally or in a parallel treaty or within a trade agreement. But the fact is, there's going to be pressure on the trading system because we use Kim's term terminology, which also I agree with, the extent you open up the concept that it's a legitimate exercise of jurisdiction, not to be complicit in what you consume be it with respect to destroying the planet environmentally, or be it with respect to uh, the protection of labor rights, then obviously that has spillover effects that has some impacts on third countries which are gonna raise trade concerns. And so it seems inevitable that somehow trade agreements are gonna to have to deal with these types of issues going forward. And it's our responsibility, along with economists, to try to redesign this if we're actually gonna have a functioning trade system. Well, maybe you are in any place. Um, well, um, 
Thank you about the first question about the conceptual framework and uh, reciprocity and non reciprocity. Um, we actually include everything that might potentially have some mitigating or positive impact on negative spillovers of trade liberalization. So, for instance, uh, the ex ante obligation of Mexico to change its domestic laws so as to allow for collective bargaining um, as a condition for the USMCA is considered in, within our framework to be uh, part of a package treaty. Or the obligation of Vietnam to uh, sign and ratify ILO core conventions in order to uh, have the free trade agreement with would also be one of these kind of types of uh, policies that we are interested in. Um, so both reciprocal and non-reciprocal, however, um, fix the purpose of um, initiating some, some form of change. Um, monetary compensation has been a discussion and maybe Rohan will want to, to uh, go a bit deeper into that because um, obviously, we could envisage a way how, for instance, the EU compensates India for the potential unemployment in the agricultural sector following a, a trade agreement. But then, obviously, the EU would not be uh, not agree to just uh, send some money and not have any control over what is actually uh, happening with that kind of money, and then. I'm a bit skeptical because you enter a sphere where you come very close to kind of a planned economy form of um, interaction where um, you decide which sectors need the money, which jobs are required in the future. So what kind of trainings you offer to the former um, farmers that lost their jobs, which has a uh, a risk of killing innovation, as, as we actually know. So um, we, we, are, we have discussed that. And maybe just to, to finish here quickly, the definition of non-discrimination. Obviously, that's the core problem. I, I actually think that um, if we talk about legitimacy of the current system, this is one of the very critical points where the current system has actually a risk of losing its legitimacy legitimacy to some extent. So we need to overcome that, even if theoretically we would agree that it would be possible to discriminate on this basis, um, we still don't see it happening in practice. So tariff schedules are not adjusted to this possibility. We do not treat sustainable products more preferentially. We do not have different tariff schedules for green economy products vis-a-vis other um, economic products. And so what we see in different initiatives like the EFTA Indonesia agreement, where actually for the first time we have preferential tariffs for sustainable products, they are explicitly actually trying to tackling this problem and overcoming it um, with the uh, new set of rules um, that we still have to see how they stay actually um, work in practice. We have one minute left. Uh, maybe we can go just very tiny bit all the time. But can I suggest that we hear the remarks which uh, were still requested, uh, and then Rohan, Tim, two of you will then have the, the final word for a brief reaction. Not everything uh, has to be replied to. Feel free to also make observations, remarks, or objections. And uh, then we're ready for Carol that. Uh, uh, Federico, I will engage with you on non discrimination. Uh, and anyone who wants to be part of this on the way to the coffee in the break. Yes, yeah, thanks. And I'll be brief. I have a comment on coercion or one of jurisdiction. Very brief. On coercion, I wonder, or unilateralism, in German speaking, I wonder where if that can uh, backfire. So, of course, we are very short in time. I'll just give you an example of what I mean by that. So, you have the EU. Um, Mercosur negotiations, the EU is saying now we have this new thing that we're not negotiating that we'd like this to be, you know, uh, considered. And do that we ask in a way, the Brazilian administration was saying this is like an imposition, you know, the package is uh, uh, finished. 
And he says it's out to him by coercion or unilateralism. I wonder whether these sort of moves can backfire if we think, and I agree with you, that climate change is our top priority. If you look at the Douglas administration, deforestation has gone down by 33%. So you are telling a doctor who's promoting these kind of measures that, you know, you know we're going to coerce you, we're going to be unilateral with you. And we know that government don't want to be coerced, population don't want to be coerced either. So these kind of you know, backfires, it creates naturalist responses that go actually in the opposite direction you're trying. So I do wonder if we need to be very careful here. So actually, there might be people that want to be involved, but not in this coercive manner, but rather in a more cooperative manner. So what do you and the US can bring into the conversation in sort of partnership, you know, rhetoric of the American partnership, what is on the table, whether it's financial compensation or whether it's something else. Because so this goes to the jurisdiction part. There's been a lot of, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, problems of the of, of the Paris meetings, and the Thomas have over and over again talked about the knowledge. And this goes to the, the coercion. Now, the, the European Union talks about forced technology. We, I mean, Alan Sykes, you know, uh, says this is there's nothing forced here. You know, if you don't want to invest in country, yeah, you just go to another country. There's no forcing you to invest there. So the language of coercion is all over the place. And I think we need to be careful, you know, because nobody wants to be. And because climate change is so important, I think we need to create incentives. I think that's a very important book that brings everybody on board on the table. And that's what the jurisdiction could go the other way around. A country like Brazil could say, if there is you know, a, a, climate, a climate crisis like similar to the COVID pandemic, I'm not going to afford the trip that way. Why should I? I mean, actually, you know that people die in here. And this, you know, I think it's, it's a very important one right? because consuming countries could also say for public reasons that not going to, you know, when the trips agreement without knowledge of government, because you are implementing CIMA without knowledge of So I think that there is a need for new thinking, but it's one that needs to keep in mind that everybody has to know a constituency that needs to vote for them, that they get voted in every four years, it's not only in the EU and, and in the US, but it's only in Brazil or in Chile or in South Africa. Thank you, Thank you very much for this panel 21 on Berlin and Pinar. Yeah, very quickly, thank you very much for all the speakers. What I was wondering is you all made reference to public international law, and one of the most relevant things here, I think, is the extraterritoriality impact of these legislation. And often, all these countries which are heavily legislating are going into the sphere of the state of third country. So, how do you reconcile this extraterritoriality impact when you compare with constitutional law? In particular, EU constitutional law, it's very easy to say. That the sentence in the EU treaty says, which may appreciably affect the internal market, but for trade, we don't have this. So, how can you legislate a bill where the EU treaty doesn't already give an impact effect? So, the effect doctrine is okay under competition law, but we don't have it under EU trade law. So, I'm wondering with the you know, new legislation by the European Union, this uh, corporate sustainability due diligence requirement. Reporting requirement is hard for American companies, for main companies. We're only talking about trade and the intergovernmental relationship here, but we really need to focus on what will be bought by companies, and it's a huge problem that they have to comply with. And I have one point for Rohan. I found very interesting his comments that me coming from a developing country and having existed and you know fought against uh, Mr. Trump's policies for a while. I remember Mr. Trump uh, really questioning the developing country status of countries like Turkey, India. So now you're talking about negotiating with these countries and getting technical assistance in trading from those countries. But you know what? They may tell you, well, you no longer qualify for developing countries. Why should I give you any technical assistance? This is a very critical topic in the WTO. I mean, do we still qualify like China, India, Turkey, Brazil? Do we still qualify for technical assistance to train? Do we need to get graduated from the developing countries? I think we need to think about this as well. Hello, Eleven, on uh, the See, I've I done my homework. I studied the uh, um, Ilaria, did you have your hand up or, or is there a burning remark? If not, uh, Rohan and Tim, if that's okay, for the final word. Oh, I just didn't need the time out to be very brief. So, Federico, I, I would uh, 
I agree, but I incorporate Charlotte's remarks about non discrimination. I think that um, in some ways, the, you know, original sin might be not the right expression, but but if there was something you could go back and fix, it would be that interpretation. Um, and uh, um, my understanding is that the the CBAM and the deforestation regulation is, is maybe prompted the um, the EU to start to think about maybe whether it's worth putting a little pressure behind that. And I, I think a lot of good can be done. But um, but but as Charlotte said, I think there's a lot of work to be done to sort of uh, fix that. It's not a um, it's an immediate fix. Um, and, and I think in just the interest of time, maybe I better stop there. Uh, just a quick comment, Dr. Nichols, uh, point and your point regarding developing country definition. So you said, should trade agreement be a forum where you devise such uh, policies? So I would say the first point is, should we let uh, a chapter like labor hijack the entire potential gains from the trade agreement? Uh, you know, trade agreement not materializing in the first place. Second, we have precedents for technical adjustment assistance within the trade agreements. We have provisions in almost every trade agreement, but these are best endeavor so far. For some strange reasons, they have not been binding obligations. Instead, the punitive measures have been made as binding obligations. So maybe we can bring these provisions to the fore and try. Uh, and also the last point is, uh, we should see this as the largest from a developed country to a developing country. Let us both be selfish. Let us see which are the sectors where we want access in a developing economy. For instance, if UK uh, has a trade agreement with uh, India, they want access to dairy and cheese. India doesn't want to open up. So India can have an estimate of the kind of job losses impact it sees. And then maybe UK can assist India in addressing those issues and have a, a proportionate market access. So it is a win-win for both the parties. Thank you so much. Thank you.